This morning we'll be speaking on season change in life and ministry. Can we say that word together? Season change in life and ministry. Even if you are a worker in a church, this will help you because or you're just a believer. Season change in life and ministry. We're going to be look, talking from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 7. I would like to read that and we'll take off from there. Praise the Lord. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold they were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and I answered O Lord thou knowest again he said unto me prophesy upon these bones and say unto them O ye bo dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath into you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. May the Lord bless the reason of his word, or the reading of the word of the Lord is blessed. Now, the background of this story, if you read down, it said this is the nation of Israel. It was something prophetic for the people of God. But the valley of dry bones is a place of devastation, is a place that things have been dry for a long time. Sometimes in individual lives, in ministry life, in your service for God, you could go through a season that we, det we can consider a season of dryness. But I want to say to you, child of God, this morning, if you will note it down, that God is a God of seasons. Your life and ministry are defined by seasons. Somebody, can you say that with me? God is a God of seasons. My life and ministry are defined by seasons. In Ecclesiastes 9.11, I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not for the swift, to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the, to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, and nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happened to them all. That word time, among many meanings, also means due season. What is he saying? He's saying that everybody has a chance. It rained this morning in the city here. Everybody got that rain. Amen? When it, the rain stops, everybody gets that, that it stops. There's dry season, there's rainy season, there's... Uh, Depending on where you live, there's um, summer, there's winter, there's, um, there's autumn, there's spring. These are seasons. God is a good God. Our lives are in seasons. What does that mean? That means the fact that you have been going through a dry season, you will not go through a dry season for the rest of your life. God is a God of season. There is what, what we call season change in life. There is a season change in ministry. What I'm saying to us this morning is that Ecclesiastes 3 1 says, To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. In fact, that word season again in Ecclesiastes 3 1, one of the meanings is an appointed time. The Bible says in Psalm 105 18 to 19 that until the time that the word of Joseph came, the word of the Lord tried him. Wiggles was said, It is better to live ready than to get ready. It is better to live ready than to get ready. You see, when you live ready, you take advantage of the season when it changes for you. Joseph was waiting. He had heard from God. And he was just waiting. He was waiting. 
when he will get before the Pharaoh, when that promotion will come. You see, women get pregnant for nine months. They don't get pregnant for two years because there's a due season. There's an appointed time. Hallelujah. When a farmer plants the seed, what is going to happen? There's going to be a harvest. I want to say to someone this morning, no matter what the story is of your life, no matter what the story is of your ministry, there's coming a new season for you. There's no need getting jealous of somebody who seems to be having a good season. God has planned for you too that there will be season change. It goes in circle. Rainy season, dry season, spring, autumn. But if you are not ready when your season changes, that's where the problem is. Hallelujah to Jesus. He said, when the Lord turned the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. You know, Moses felt he was forgotten for a long time. He, he sends a calling of God. And in trying to fulfill the call of God, he killed a man. And it landed him 40 years in a dry place. 40 years of wandering. But I thank God that we serve a God that does not forget his own. I thank God that you serve a God that does not forget you. The Bible says after 40 years, God showed up. God showed up there and said, hey, Moses, I'm talking to you. I want to send you. I don't know what you've been through. Even if you've been through some failure, failure in relationship, failure in ministry, God is a God of season and is going to turn your season around in the name of Jesus. 40 years. <laughs> I told God, I said, God, don't make it 40 years. Oh. Hallelujah. Do you know it takes a patient man to wait for 40 years to come into purpose? You may say he made a mistake, but you are not perfect either. Hallelujah to Jesus. But when the time came, Abraham, 25 years. Jacob, 20 years. But I tell you something, there's a time that that season changes. I went for Jacob, God said, I am the God of Bethel. You have served Balaam long enough. Uh, you have served uh, the, the uncle Laban long enough. You've served him long enough. He's not been good to you. I'm about to change your season after 20 years. I want to say to you sitting here this morning, don't miss your season. You will not miss your season. You will live ready watching for your season. You will not compromise before your season because there's a season change in your life. There's a season change in your ministry. God has planned that for you. And if you live ready, that season will come and fall upon you. It will come and fall upon your family. It will come and fall upon your children. When they are celebrating wedding, new buildings for their ministry, new cars and new things and you are saying to yourself, I don't know when man is going to happen. I'm here to announce to you that the God of season will not forget you. It flooded for Noah. Everything was dying around him. My Bible tells me and God remembered Noah. God is a God of season. He will not forget you. Your season is about to change. If you have come here this morning to hear this prophetic message in this hour i want you to join your faith with me that before we are done you will step into oil the oil that will change your season the oil that will bring you to a new day the oil that will turn it around for you is in this portal place today and because you are here you will experience a new season in the name of jesus please be seated New season and divine encounters are inseparable. You must bury the ghost of your past in order to walk in a new season. New season and divine encounters are inseparable. You must bury the ghost of your past to walk in a new season. Because of plenty on our plates, I'll be giving you the scriptures. You know many of them. You just write them down. Exodus chapter 4, 1 to 4. Romans 7, 24. Isaiah 26, 12 to 14. Let me give you the scriptures again. Exodus 4, 1 to 4. Romans 7, 24. Isaiah 26, 12 to 14. In the, in the story of Exodus chapter 4, uh, when God spoke to Moses and he kept complaining, I can't go, I'm a failure. In fact, if they see me in Egypt, they would like to kill me. People may still remember what I did. Sometimes in life, sometimes in ministry, mistakes are made. And when God is sending you, you are beginning to question God, how are we going to make this happen? You know? He was like, how are we going to make this happen? 
And God told him in Exodus 4, he said, what is in your hand? The same rod he has been using for a long time. Some of us are expecting that when God changes our season, he will give us a new rod. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You are thinking God will give you a new rod. Eh? That's, is that same you? Is that same grace upon your life that he's going to use? Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? When he threw the rod down, the thing became a snake. And how did, where did he pick the, 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 the snake from? From the, from the tail. If you know anything about snakes, you don't pick from the tail. Because when you pick from the tail, what happens? It's going to bite you. You see, in the presence of the anointing, and what we are told by some historians is that at the top of that rod that Moses held, there were notations, markings of important events in his life, including when he killed that guy in Egypt. There were markings, how he killed that guy in Egypt, all kinds of things were there. So the rod represented the man's history. But you see, your failures cannot deny a new season for you. The fact that your ministry didn't work well, something tragic happened to you, maybe you lost a loved one, maybe somebody walked out of your church, it doesn't change your season. The one who determines season change is the one that called you. And I'm happy we serve a God that doesn't forget. I mean, 40 years is long enough for someone to say, ah, after 40 years, what else? But God came to him and said, throw that thing down. It was a snake. But that snake couldn't bite him. When he picked it up, it became a rod again. What I want to say to you, this day that we are approaching the God of all seasons, if there have been things that have been broken, have been destroyed in your life, as we approach God's altar today, there will be a season change. There will be a miracle. There will be a turnaround. God will take the venom out of that serpent. God will take the venom out of that bad memory. God will take the venom out of the thing that tried to destroy you. God will take the venom out of your history. God will turn your story. He will turn your test into a testimony. He will turn your mystery into a message. Is somebody hearing the Lord this morning? I want to announce to you, season changes upon you, child of God. is upon your ministry, child of God. He is a God of season. Seasons come and go, but the word of God will remain. Seasons come and go, but the word of God will remain for you. Paul was writing in Romans 7 24. He said, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Now the Romans had a way to punish murderers and criminals back in the day. They would tie the murderer to the, to the, to the victim, to the, person, to the person you killed. They would tie you hand to hand, feet to feet, hands to hands, feet to feet. And you'll be carrying the person around. That's the meaning of Romans 7, 24. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? You'll be carrying around. Now, the, 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 the import of that is that the disease from that body will eventually infect the murderer and kill him. You see, there are certain things from your past that if you keep dragging around on their own, they should not be able to kill you. But if you drag them around, they will kill you. That's why Isaiah 26 from verse 12 says, Oh God, that will ordain peace for us. Other gods beside thee have we served. He said, only by thee shall we make mention of them. He said, they are dead, they are destroyed, and their memory has perished. I don't know what has happened in your life, what has happened in your ministry, but I want to let you tell you something. You need to bury that mistake before it buries you. You need to bury that relationship before it buries you. If there are things that have tormented you, that have made you to feel you cannot make it, or obvious mistake that everybody knows about, and the devil is waking you up every day and say, everybody knows you did this, everybody knows this failure happened with you, everybody knows you've been struggling in this same anger for a long time, how will they come to you? Child of God, I invite you to bury that thought this morning. I invite you to bury that past this morning. I invite you to bury that mistake this morning because when the blood of Jesus cleanses you, you can forget about it. God is a God of a new beginning. I say God is a God of a new beginning. He's a God of a new start. Even as I'm speaking now, I'm seeing in the spirit of God. I'm seeing God pouring water on some minister's feet. I see 
God pouring water or some minister's faith. When God pours you water, back in the Bible days, when you come into a place, they will wash your feet to say, we are cleansing you, you can rest now. I prophesy a rest in life for you. I prophesy a rest in ministry for you. I prophesy a rest in life for somebody. I prophesy a rest in ministry for you. Just lift your hand and receive it in the name of Jesus. Can you wave that hand and give him praise? Can you wave that hand and give him honor this morning? I prophesy a rest. I prophesy a rest for you. I prophesy a rest for you. Please sit down for a bit. Let me explain something about how the prophetic works. Many of the times when we are under this grace, God may not single you out. I didn't want to stop my message because I could actually pick up people I saw in the spirit. But I, don't, I want to go with the flow of the word. Once you connect with it, it's a rhema for now. Once you connect with it, a brother was sharing a testimony here on Sunday. I didn't listen to it myself. But Pastor Joel recapped it for me. He said he lost everything. Beside that, he couldn't walk. Am I correct? Those of you that were here. He said, but he was listening to Radio Church. Even this testimony he gave, me too, I have not had it myself personally. He said, he was listening to Radio Church. And I said, under the anointing, now get up. Right? And walk. And he just took down simple word. He had been down for long. He, had, he has lost houses. Properties. Business. But when there's a prophetic unction. And you learn to recognize it. He said he got up. He said looking for the church. When he at that time. The man is doing wonderfully well now. But it took one word from God. May I say it again? I saw God pouring water on people's feet here. What is your name now? You didn't stand up. I'm going to find the man. You. Stand up. Come on. I know you're a bishop. Can you run in faith that God is pouring water on your feet? Just take a run. Take a run, take a run. A, good, a quick one. Go, 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 go. Uh, no, no, no. Bishop, come, come, come. That way, just run. 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 And you, that, that other guy, do the same thing. If anybody feels like God is pouring water on them, you need to run. If you feel, run, 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 run. It's a prophetic act. If you feel like God is pouring water on your leg, you better run. I'm only giving two minutes for that run. I will continue my message. <laughs> Don't hit anybody. Don't hit anybody. Find a place to, even me, I'm running. <laughs> even me, I'm running for that water. <laughs> or me and my family, I'm running for that water. I'm running for that water. <laughs> I'm running for the water God is pouring on people's feet. I'm running for that water. I receive it for my family, for my ministry. Rest. We have one more minute to run in faith. I'm running for that rest. I receive it. I receive the prophetic. I'm running for it. I'm running for it. Thank you, Lord, for fresh water. Fresh water on my feet, on my children, on my spouse, on restoration. Oh, many people will receive it. Now just lift your hand for one minute and thank him. You know the biggest problem right now? See that house rent paid? See favor? See money? See people? See crowd on Sunday morning? I said see crowd on Sunday morning. Let's wave that hand and thank him. Let's see money coming in. Let's see people coming in. Oh, let's give him a shout in the house. Oh, let's give him a shout in the house. Oh, let's give him a shout in the house. Let's give him a shout in the house. Give him a shout in the house. Give him a shout in the house. Oh, hallelujah. You will come back and testify. When God brought this man to the valley of dry bones, God knew what he was going to do. When God is trying to engage you in a new season and he's talking to you, the assignment is already finished. 
It just, but as I was speaking, I just saw what a fear on uh, Apostle, what's his name again? Now his name is Ben Paul. And this man, what's his name? New man. I saw what a fear. I said, God, this water make it reach everybody. Oh, I receive mine. We shall see rest in your ministry. I see a car blue in color for somebody here. I see a car blue in color for somebody here. Supernatural provision of children. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Please be seated. These prophetic actions. <laughs> that may be the only reason you came safe. You will now get to your church and say, ah, I just went to that meeting I came back. Is how somebody just met me with, you know, better something. A lot ring. Good one. There are levels of a lot. May you get the highest one in Jesus' name. <laughs> you see, as we teach today, you will understand. I, I am beginning to see why God is taking this pattern. Because many times, genuine people don't even understand the prophetic. So they get sidetracked. But when we begin to experience it ourselves, you will see that it's not difficult. Another thought is that your new season must hear your voice. Your new season must hear your voice. Uh, he said to him, uh, Can these bones live? In verse 3. Verse 4, he said, Prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's verse 4. I don't know why it works this way. But for Abraham, his body had to hear his voice. Sarah's body had to hear his voice and her voice. My name is Sarah. My name is Abraham. You start calling yourself what God has already called you. You see, when the devil tempted Eve and, Eve and Adam, he said to them, um, if you eat the fruit, you'll be like God. But it was a lie because you were already like God. God made them in his image after his own likeness. They were already like God. So you see, God calls you what you want, he wants you to be. But until you start calling yourself that, Satan can deceive you. I'm a father of nations. The new building is completed. Prophesy as you are commanded. This morning before it's all said and done, you will need to speak to that season. I sense in my spirit, one thing I've noticed about God, the most difficult times, like 2020, was actually a very great year for us personally. Personally and in this minute, it was a very great year. When Satan puts pressure, God adds grace. Because we are sin abounds, grace much more. So when you feel pressure, God is saying, I'm adding grace. But you have to be looking to the grace, not to the pressure of the time. So let your season hear your voice. God was saying to Moses, in other words, I'm changing your season, but Egypt needs to hear your voice again. There are certain things in your life that must hear your voice today. Hallelujah. Your season needs to hear your voice. Second Kings uh, 1 then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Don't said the Lord tomorrow about this time. Shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria? There had been a famine. Elisha said, A measure of fine flour for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. Somebody there needed to speak. Somebody there needed to speak who had authority to speak. This morning, you have authority to speak to your season. You have authority to speak the word of God. Be instant in season and out of season. 
You know, some people, in season, they will speak. Out of season, they will not speak. What is out of season? When it's not convenient. Sometimes it doesn't look like there's a good season. But you need to still speak that word of God. And as you keep speaking it, and, and the season can hear your voice, I want to assure you this morning that there will be a season change in the name of Jesus Christ. You keep saying it. You keep saying it. Joseph told the other two guys, Oh, they lied against me. That's why I got here. But it was anticipating a new season. I said that new season is coming as you are speaking in season and out of season in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 of Ezekiel 37. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And that's an important thing we need to look at this morning. Knowing the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, knowing the Holy Spirit as a person is key to your season change. Can someone say that with me? Knowing the Holy Spirit as a person is key to my season change. In Luke 135, uh, Mary asked the angel, How shall these things be, seeing I know not a man? He said, The Holy Ghost shall what? Come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing. I saw somebody in Abeokuta Church just now. I think they joined in that season celebration. And God is telling that person that there's a visitation in Jesus' name. He said, um, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of a higher shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Praise the name of the Lord. You see, Jesus said, John 16, 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. You know, I was in one church some years ago, and there was a young man there. I gave him a prophetic word. I said to him, um, go and buy land. I'm remembering two of those stories now. I said, go and buy land. He said, <laughs> he laughed. He said, I don't even have money to buy block. I said, but God told me I should tell you to go and buy land. He said, okay. So he started. God, eh? He said, suddenly when he started trying to buy the land, money just started coming. He bought block. He bought this. He bought the other one. Uh, I think a year or two ago, Pastor Joel, if you remember, I, mean, I think you were there too. We want to dedicate that guy's house. And uh, it changed his story, totally changed his life. You see, sometimes God will give you, he will give you a word. But if there's no action on that word, it will not manifest for you. I went to another church. The pastor was with me a few weeks ago. He said, you came to our church. There was a couple believing for the fruit of the womb and you told the, the, them that you are going to have a baby boy. I said, well, the thing happened, but the doctor, the scan said it was a baby girl. But then the thing, when they gave the bad, the, the thing turned to a baby boy. I said, if God has said it, then God can do it. That same pastor shared another one with me. I don't know if he's here this morning. He said, you look at another guy who was struggling to pay 100,000 naira rent. By this time tomorrow, measure of fine flour and two measures of barley for a shekel. If God spoke it, not man, if it came from the Holy Ghost and you mix faith, it can change your season. It can change your season. That guy built house. He even came here. He came here to, he came here to thank God. I haven't seen him since that time. I think I'm going to that church again sometime soon. The truth about it is that we have a part. Your season has to hear your voice. You need to say, Jesus said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, 
Your season can hear your pastor's voice, but your season will work better when it can hear your voice. When you can find a scripture, when you can find a word, maybe a rhema from the word of God, something God spoke to you as you read the Bible, or a scripture that was quickened to you as we are preaching the word, or something that was given to you by the Spirit of God, and you start speaking to that thing. God has said this concerning me. That husband is coming. That fruit of the womb is coming. And you keep declaring it. As your season can hear your voice, I tell you, it will not be your voice again. It will be hearing the voice of God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Drop that past behind you. The enemy has been bringing it up again and again. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Your ability to follow the Holy Spirit will determine your provision in your different seasons. Someone say with me, my ability to follow the Holy Spirit. Yes. I'm seeing a sister in my spirit. The Lord said, I don't want to call you up. He said, you will live and not die. Oh, oh. I wish you, you will lift your hand. He said, you will live and not die. He said, you will live and not die. He said, you will live and not die. You will live and not die. Hmm. God said, Behold, I will cause breath. You know, 1 Kings um, 17, we, we just write it down, 6 to 9, Luke 4, 24 to 27. Let me read Luke 4, 24 to 27. Luke 4, 25. But I'll tell you a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, or Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarapta, city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. Now, you have to know how to follow the Holy Spirit. Abraham, went down to Egypt when there was economic crisis. Isaac, God said, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in Gera. Many of us just do things in the ministry out of tradition. Everybody is doing this. Everybody do the other one. Which one is the Spirit of God telling you to do? What is moving the market now is food because there is a problem. Okay, so I'm going to open a restaurant. The restaurant beside you is doing well. Your own is not doing well. Maybe your own is not supposed to be a restaurant. Maybe it's supposed to be something else. You see, you need to, and we'll talk about that in the next point. You, we need to develop a relationship with the Spirit of God. Because the valley of dry bones was revived when the Word of God was spoken and the Spirit of God was able to move. I want to tell you, there is no situation you found yourself that if the Holy Ghost should move, that you won't come out of it. Look at Isaiah 40 now. He said, who instructed him? Maybe from above verse 26 or something. He said, who instructed him when he created the universe? A person that made the whole universe cannot, cannot organize your life. He can organize my own life. He can organize my life. Hallelujah. Now, Elijah, he decreed that famine, didn't he? And then God told him, go and hide by the brook of Cherith. And by the brook of Cherith, the Bible says that the ravens brought him food. If you know the history, the Jewish history, you, a tradition rather, you don't eat things that are brought by a vulture. It's an unclean animal. Amen? An unclean animal was bringing him food. Most of us will have rejected that. Peter had the same problem. When the sheet came down and he saw different animals, he said, I don't eat what is unclean. My brother, your enemies will feed you in this season. Don't be religious, oh. Don't be religious. I didn't say you should go and commit crime. But if a vulture brings it, I will take. I won't say it's because it's angulu. If vulture brings the food, I will take, except you are not hungry. He didn't say you should eat the vulture. He said you should eat what the vulture brought. 
God didn't say prophet Elijah eat vulture. He said the vulture is just a courier service. I'm not allowed to disclose many things here. <laughs> but vultures have brought food for me before, not physically. You look at the person God wants to use for you, you shake your head, say, God, please find another person to use. <laughs> say, God, how can you, this type of person? No, 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 God, use somebody else to bless me. We cannot choose the agent of our deliverance. Some people say, I don't really like you. But okay, but I like the work you are doing. There are people that have brought things here, especially to our orphanage. When I go, so I say, Who brought them? They will tell me, I'll say, Praise the Lord. That's all I can say, Praise the Lord. Maybe God has looked for some Christians to send. They didn't hear. Sometimes in your ministry, God will look for some Christians to send. They didn't hear. I remember Miko was sharing a testimony with me one time. I don't want to make sure they know of this. We drove by a place in Ibadan. And he was sharing with me how that ministry got that big place. The people that God used for them, eh? Ordinarily should not be used for them. The people God will use to change your season sometime. Don't discriminate. He didn't say eat vulture, but that means where that vulture bring. Just collect them. Say vulture, thank you. Bye bye. Cha. You have to know the Holy Spirit. Let's move. Point two. Very fast. I don't know if I could, maybe I would have failed there because of my religious upbringing. Maybe some of you are more spiritual. The way I was raised in the Baptist church, you don't, you don't go and visit a widow alone. Talk less of going to take a room in our house. Remove your religious guys. I read that story very well. Elijah lived with that woman. Eh? Pastor. <laughs> you just moved to one place. The only accommodation is one woman. And you're a man of God. And it's just you and her son that are at home. Your mind will start thinking, what will people be thinking? Am I right? Say, Kai. Holy Spirit send me another person to use another person for me. The prophet will have died. I know this is a difficult teaching. I may sound against ministerial ethics. Now, let me balance it before you kill yourself with that scripture. <laughs> Roy Hicks, one of Papa Higgins' people in those days said, you can take a scripture and make it say anything you want it to say. And we don't want to be guilty of that. Amen. Elijah was not going around trying to find widows to live with. <laughs> he didn't get up and say, let me go to Amguan Romi. Which widow has accommodation? <laughs> You're a widow, you have space, I'm entering your house. That was not what he was doing. He was on an assignment to save that woman's life. That was where he went there. And he had the grace, there's no evil record that was there. Praise the Lord. So don't take this as a message of looking for accommodation with widows. Anytime you lie in it and say, well, <laughs> which widow has place? <laughs> no, 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 no. You'll be killing yourself. That's not the point. In the ministry of Jesus, there was a time he said, go to the reef, uh, lake. You will find a, 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 a fish with a gold coin in his mouth. Is that not true? Cocoa in his mouth. Another time he used a little boy's lunch. Abby? Another time he said a man with the pitcher of water in his hand. God doesn't have one way of meeting your needs in your life and in your ministry. Better learn that one very fast. 
Some people, the only way God will meet them is in the offering that comes into the church. Anything outside of the offering that comes into the church, God cannot meet them. God might lead you in the area of different streams to bring different financial blessings. Even in the secular world, you are working for the federal government or the state government or in an office, then you have a little kiosk when you come back from work. Sometimes the little kiosk is paying more than the salary. I might say, I'm getting an amen on that one. Or you might decide that uh, you are buying one achaba. You give another person achaba. As he's riding the achaba, the day away the shop no work and the government did not pay on time, the achaba may come in handy. I don't know if anybody is understanding what I'm trying to say. People have put God in one kind of box like this. That God, if you don't move this way, you cannot move. And that is why you are where you are. We need to know the Spirit of God. Some people even go further. If I woke up to, I've not even shared this. A revelation came to me a few days ago, early morning. I just had it in the Spirit. Um, farming and small scale industry in a recessed economy. That's something that came in the spirit. It just came to me in the spirit. And I knew that that is a topic we need to do something about in this church. Why are you standing up? <laughs> it just came. In fact, I wrote it down. It's somewhere I wrote it, but we've not done anything, but we'll do something about it. What I'm trying to say is that you, you need to provide things that God can use to bless you. Some women, a little farm in the backyard is solving the food situation at home. I know a man of God in this town, he doesn't buy food. If I give food out, because he, he farms. The rice he makes is enough for the year. I'm not saying that will work for you. But you need to hear God. You need to hear God. It might be a bike. Someone say, how can a church own machine? <laughs> Don't own now. If God said it, he may not say it to you, but I wouldn't criticize another person that was in prayer and God said, buy an achaba. That will be bringing something in. The way some of you are looking at me is like, oh my God. How many of you are getting something out of this point? But we have put God. God changed with Elijah. When the brook dry, you want to die at the brook. If the brook is dry, say, Father, is there any other thing here? And then he moved him to do something else. Sometimes the things that God leads you to do on the side may be more productive than the main sometimes. Now, I'm not telling every pastor to resign their pulpit and start going to Abba to buy spare parts. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But godly investments for you as a family and for your ministry is not out of place. Once it doesn't take away from the main thing God has called you to do. I think we said enough there. Is there an amen in the house? Amen. All right. So let's, let's go on. Uh -huh. ah. I hope I can finish this today. So there were many lepers in Israel. I have to comment on this and then we'll try to move quickly. There were many lepers in Israel... But unto none was Elisha sent, but unto Naaman. All right? There were many widows in Israel. Unto none was Elijah sent, but to the widow of Zarephath. You will notice that both Naaman and the widow of Zarephath were not bona fide Jews. In fact, the widow of Zarephath, they say she lived in a Gentile quarter. Which means... Maybe God looked around, couldn't find anybody that would connect with that grace. Ah, 
and God had to go outside to bless somebody with it. That will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Maybe if it was somebody else, we would have said, Ah, prophet, what are you doing in my, in my place? Don't you realize me and my child were about to die? We invite all the news media houses to cover it. Look at this hungry prophet. The anointing you don't invest in cannot increase you. All right. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 is something we quote all the time. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. The word communion is kononia in the Greek. It means partnership, fellowship, and intimacy. And the point here is that the communion of the Holy Spirit is fellowship, partnership, and intimacy. The communion of the Holy Spirit is what? Fellowship, partnership, and intimacy. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Okay? Let's, um, Philippians 3.10, Oh, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. You, know, you see, we need to walk, the day we are living in now, the day we are living in now. Wigglesworth said, I find my rest in the presence of God. Hallelujah. The communion, the kononia, the fellowship, the early church. One reason they were so powerful was that they were able to walk in fellowship. They, were able to, they, they knew the Holy Spirit. You know, we read it earlier. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, my prayer for you is that you will you will develop in your relationship with God that you will know Him. You know, some people will call you on the phone. You don't need to say anything. You can just say, ah, Pastor Edo or uh, Pastor Akoji because you are used to their voice. Hallelujah. One of the ways you can get used to the voice of God is praying in the Holy Ghost. Another way is reading the Word of God and meditating in it. You see, because when the 9-11 happened in America, there were people that morning that they had the voice of God, don't go to work today. John G. Lake said one day he was driving on the side of the road and he had the Holy Ghost told him, move to the other side. It's like in Nigeria, we drive on the right and you are told to go to the left. Is it, does it make sense? He said, but the minute he did that, a big truck came and cleared where he would have been and he would have been killed because there was a big drop to the side. Child of God, you need a one-to-one -one relationship with the Holy Spirit in this hour. Can I get a little amen on that one? Oh, that I may know him. How do you know him? When you are spending time meditating the word, you are spending time praying in the Holy Ghost. Every time you pray in the Holy Ghost, it's not because there's a need in your life. You pray in the Holy Ghost to build yourself up. Jude 20, building yourself up in, the, in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Ministers, we need to pray in the Holy Ghost. And when you are praying in the Holy Ghost, look inside of you. Which thoughts are coming? Which impressions are coming? You know, prayer is a, is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. A lot of people just pray, Father, 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 shout, 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 shout. Well, I was an undergraduate in those days. There was one man of God who used to come to the school. There's a place they used to call the woods at our university at that time. When this man of God came to the woods, he would just be running. His own prayer is to run. He would just be running. So we young people, we used to watch him. Say, ah, this man can pray. So we started copying him. We start running. The man will run. After about 10 minutes, eh? He said, and the Holy Spirit told me that, you don't need to run. I'm here with you. Just stay in one place. <laughs> you know, let your prayer be something that flows out of you. Let it be something that flows out of you. Pray in the Holy Ghost and listen to your heart. What did I say? Pray in the Holy Ghost and... Say it again. Pray in the Holy Ghost and... Say it again. Pray in the Holy Ghost and... 
When you do that, impressions will begin to come. Sometimes pictures will begin to come. Write those things down. You may miss it sometimes, but with time, you'll start getting familiar with the Spirit of God. The day we are living in, we have to be people of the Word and people of the Spirit. It can save your life. I said it can save your life. It can save your life. It's very, very important in the day and, and time we're living in that we learn how to flow. How to flow. How to flow. It's very, very essential. I can give you many examples of things like this. Where people, uh, you know, if, if you don't have that communion, I mean, your wife, you and your wife can exchange a glance. I mean, a glance just looking at each other and you pass a message you can look at another person and the person will not get what you are saying because you've known yourself with time my prayer for you in this season is that you will get to know him like Paul prayed oh that I may know him oh that I may know him I can give you many personal examples where the Holy Spirit just brings something up you act on it and something big happens hallelujah to Jesus hallelujah to Jesus but these things take training. You're a man of God. You're a, you're a child of God. You need to train your spirit. You need to spend time. One of the easy ways you can train is when God tells you to give somebody something. How many of you have ever felt an impression to give something here? Uh, if your hand no raise, you get well out. Something just, I feel like giving something. Do it. Even if you miss it, you are learning something. Or you get an impression, Forgive. Those of us who are married, can we see our hands up? Especially the men. Someone is telling you, apologize to her. Put your hands down. How many of you did the apology? Apologize to her. I'm the head of this house. The day God wants to give you 10 million, that same voice will say, go here, you will not hear. Somebody hearing what I'm saying? Can you do amen, men? Hallelujah to Jesus. There are so many examples we can give, but let's, let's move forward again. Uh, passion and hunger for God will determine how much of the will determine how much the Holy Spirit will manifest in your life and ministry. Passion and hunger for God will determine how much the Holy Spirit will manifest in your life and ministry. Matthew five six, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Isaiah sixty four seven and eight. Isaiah 64, 7 and 8. And there's none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. He said, There's none that does what? Stirreth up themselves. Stirreth up themselves. He said, But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art the porter. We are all the work of thy hand. Sometimes you have to stir yourself up. Wigglesworth said, the secret of spiritual success is a hunger that persists. The secret of spiritual success is a hunger that persists. It is an awful condition to be satisfied with one's spiritual attainments. God was and is looking for hungry and thirsty people. You know, you need to stir yourself up. Stir yourself up. Stare. Let me let me say something to us. I don't know about you. I'm so hungry to see God move that I am always looking out for opportunities. Every time I'm praying for somebody, I'm saying, "Let me see how God will do it this time." Somebody hearing what I'm saying? Don't get satisfied with where you are. Stir yourself up. You have been praying thirty minutes. Tell yourself you are going to one hour. You've been playing one hour. Say yourself, you are going to one and a half, two hours, three hours. Just keep staring yourself up to seek him. Let me tell you, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. God is looking to release glory into your life, into your ministry. He wants to take you deeper into himself. Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what God has prepared for those that love him. Is there an amen somewhere in the house of the Lord today? Are you still with me? All right. How many of you feel I should continue? If you feel I should continue, wave your hand. All right, please stand up for a minute and just stretch because I'm going to another 
You don't need to go out to just where you are. Just stretch. I've been teaching one hour now. Just lift your hand and praise him. And just stretch. 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 Uh -huh. you, you are allowed to move one step like this, one step like this. And then come back one step like that, one step like that. You can even take four steps, so, but don't leave the hollow. Just, just walk around a bit, move, move. You know, when you get older, these things are necessary. Oh. Don't be sitting down forever. Oh. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together for the Lord as we take our seats again. Amen. All right. Take this point down. Knowing the Word and the Holy Spirit will deliver you from deception and the spirit of divination. Knowing the Word and the Holy Spirit will deliver you from deception and the spirit of divination. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 to 19. 1 Samuel 28, verse number 6. First Samuel 28, verse number 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us and brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who show us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out of her that hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their, their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew, drew them into the market's place unto the rulers. Now, this is a spirit of divination. What the girl was saying, in, in some churches today, this woman will be a prophetess because the church of Jesus Christ does not know how to discern. This girl was, what this girl was saying was the truth. What she was saying, oh, these are the servants of God. It's a fact. They are the servants of God. But it did not come out of a spirit of truth. Hello, somebody. It didn't come out of a spirit of truth. She was saying, oh, they are the servants of God. But it didn't come out of a spirit of truth. The spirit of divination, is, uh, divination is taken from the Greek word Putin, which means a python. It means a python. Um... Divination from the Latin to foresee, to foretell, to predict, to prophesy. One of the things you see common today is people prophesying up and down. And a lot of these things are not coming by the Spirit of God. And um, Isaiah 44, just write it down. 25 to 28. Deuteronomy 8, 10 to 12. These scriptures, Isaiah 44, 25 to 28. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. They tell us how God hates definition, soothsaying, uh, and all this uh, uh, spirit of witchcraft that is now rampant in the body of Christ. I remember many years ago when I was in a certain village, when I was in a certain village, um, we, were, we did a crusade, people got saved, and when it came to time to minister the Holy Ghost baptism, this girl started speaking in tongues. But something, it just, inside of me, I just know this is not the Holy Spirit. Just like Paul did there. When we cast out the spirit from the girl, the tongue ceased. How many of you have been in a place where somebody is supposedly praying in the spirit, but you're, 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 you just felt uncomfortable inside? You felt... Now, many of those spirits are now operating large in the body of Christ. And you as a pastor... You need to be aware of those things. Everybody speaking in tongues may not be speaking by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That our brother who testified here, he told you all the cults he has been into. Every gift of the Spirit, there's a counterfeit. If there's a counterfeit, there's an original. Amen? 
And the devil has so done it these days that the counterfeit is everywhere. I want to beg pastors and I want to beg men or women of God and even Christians generally, be careful where you put your head. The fact that there's a sign of a church on it does not mean it's a church. I have a guy, a young man here, who, was, who went somewhere and the man will have sign on the ground and will have all kinds of candles and they will stand around it and they will put somebody in the middle and they will call the name of Jesus. Now, don't, that, is not, that is not the Holy Spirit. So how, how do you know the manifestation of the Holy Spirit? You need to know the Word of God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, um, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. But all these workets, that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. You see, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit operates as the Spirit of God wills. Many of these places, many of these places, people will do certain things. They will do some incantation. They will say certain things. They will put certain things in place. They will give you certain things. And those things they are giving you, they become like mediums that attract spiritual power. Talk to me, somebody. When you go somewhere and you are given a soap, all right, you need to show me from the Bible. Come on. You are giving a soap. You are giving special oil. You have to help me on this one. You give me a special stone. Help me on this one. Huh? You are giving me a special candle. Help me on this one. Salt. Help me on this one. Huh? Coconut. Help me on this one. Huh? 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 Bad luck. Apple. I never believe personally that I would live to see the day when charismatic and Pentecostals would degenerate to this level. I never believe it will happen because when we came to the things of God, when we came into this, the big thing was the word of God. It was the word of God. We used to pride ourselves that we were not carrying these things around. We are holding to the Bible. That was we who came from denominational churches, you know? We say, the word of God is what makes it. Some people, oil of deliverance, oil of promotion, oil of this, tie this one on your neck, tie this one there, wake up. In fact, when I did one, one conference for a group of people, the leader of that group told me that, ah, thank you for what you shared, though. He said, one dear sister in Joss, somebody told her that she has to enter deliver by 6 a.m. She, she converted, and the group she fell into, she has to enter the river by 6 a.m. Listen to me, if you are into any of those things, you are in deception, and familiar spirits are operating with you. you, you have a problem in your life, you need to repent, you need to stop walking around, you need to stop deceiving people in the body of Christ. Everything I've said, there's nothing I'm taking back. It's all true. Hallelujah. We were in one European country. And while I was preaching in church, I noticed a girl. Every time the anointing comes on me and I'm preaching, she would just start doing one kind. The girl would just start. Ah. I said, what is wrong? So they, not, they later brought the girl to us and I asked her, when did this thing start? She said when she was in the UK. She went to one of these churches and they saw her that God wants to use her. And then they will call her that the spirit wants to hold her for three days. Then the thing will hold her for three days. She will be talking, she will not know what she's saying. So you see, a familiar spirit has entered. Your body is the temple of the Holy. Don't open up for evil spirits in your life. Sometimes to get that thing out of you can become a big problem. What they giving, what they are leaving you with is worse than what you went there to get. When the thing comes on the girl like this, she's not herself. Oh. See, as the spirit will, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. When something catches you, she will just be gone like that. I will do, do, do. She can be like that for three days. She will be talking. That's a medium. That's a medium. Now, another difference you need to note is that, all right, I think I have it in my note, but let me just say it quickly here. 
You know, the Old Testament Christians were not born again in the way you and I are born again. The Holy Ghost only came upon the prophet, the priest, and the kings. So everything God did for them was symbolic. Even you will see that, even Jesus, maybe you haven't seen it before, told the disciples to anoint people with oil. I will show you. Before the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, God dealt with them in types and shadows. Naaman, go and dump yourself in the river. He told one person to lie on his side for one year. He told one prophet to go naked. Are you now going to be going naked because you, you want to hear God? He said, lie on your side. For, those were prophetic acts. Prophetic action. So many of these churches who are open, any church that is as a doctrine is practicing elements. They are just giving you opportunity for familiar spirits to come in. When they finish with you, they say, okay, this soap at 12 midnight, you have to bath it. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night, that you may observe to do all that is written therein, then thou shalt make your way prosperous and have good success. This bad luck, when you say everything wrong with you in the name of your enemy, you shall lock it and go to the river and turn your back and throw it. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night. Proverbs 4, 20 to 22. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ears unto my saying. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them into the midst of thy heart, for they are life to those that find them, and medicine to all their flesh. Isaiah says, if they do not agree with the law and the prophets, it's because there's no light in them. I think Isaiah 8, 20. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So there are symbolic acts in the Old Testament, but they cannot become doctrine in the New Testament because God gave it to them because he couldn't live in them. So he showed them those things. There are people who are building altars. They will come to your house and say, for this problem to solve, we build you an altar and it will cost you 500k. Build you an altar where you can do special prayer. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your heart is the altar. People have spent useless money. Yet, if they are doing a project in their church, they say, come and give. They will not give, but they will build an altar of 500,000. Men of God, can we say amen this morning? Amen. All right. I'll run through that because there are two, three other spirits we need to address before we quit. Another time we can pick it up. Isaiah 820, if they do not agree with the Lord and the prophets, the point I was making there, the word of God is the frequency of the Holy Spirit. The word of God is the frequency of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 820, 1 Peter 1.23, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 14, 10 to 11. Isaiah 820, 1 Peter 1, 23, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 14, 10 and 11. The word of God is the frequency of the Holy Spirit. Now, in your radio, radio church, what's the frequency of radio church? Does anybody know? Or in Victor FM? Huh? 98.9. So Sunday morning, 6.30, you are looking for radio church. Until you get to 98.9, you'll be hearing many sounds. But at 98.9, you will hear radio church. The word of God is the only thing that can help you tune these things. When you are seeing something, you have to ask yourself, does this reduce what Jesus did at Calvary? Does it reduce the work of grace that God did in my life? You keep tuning it. You keep tuning it. The word of God is the frequency. If you take the word of God, the spirit of God will not be there. So all these articles and fetish objects, the open door to familiar spirit. Now, I will just run through this. A prophetic act inspired by the Holy Spirit is not the same as the use of fetish objects as medium into the spirit walls. Can you say with me, a prophetic act, a prophetic act inspired by the Holy Spirit is not the same as the use of fetish objects as medium into the spirit world. Let me give you some prophetic acts in the Old Testament, just for those who may be interested. Uh, Naaman, 
had his bath in the in the water for healing. Second Kings five nine to fourteen. Isaiah uh, intercession, 1 Kings 18, 14 to 44. Warfare, when Moses' hands were lifted up, Exodus 17, 10 to 13. Um, Ezekiel lay on one side for more than one year, for 390 days. Ezekiel 4, 5. Imagine somebody lying on one side for 490 days. So I say, go and lie down, enter that river, and stay there for one week. Be going every morning. You are, you are, <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Calling into the ministry, First Kings 19 19. Um, so there are prophetic acts. Even in, in Mark 6 12 and 13, Jesus told them to anoint the sick with oil, which is prophetic for our day. So those were prophetic acts, but you don't make them into a doctrine. I think we said enough on that. Hallelujah. All right. I want to deal with one or two spirits. Go to Revelation 2, 14 and 50. Before I, I round up now. Revelation 2, 14 and 15. We are talking about season change. You know why we are dealing with these things? Sometimes when you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and, wait and nothing is happening, people will now start suggesting to you. If you try this, oh, is that not true? This is your picking, where no Greek come out. Let's try this one. Oh. This is your ministry, where you still get 50 people. Let's try this. Oh. That's why we're talking about these things. Now, let me deal with the spirit of Balaam. There are three spirits I want to look at. The spirit of Balaam is a false prophetic spirit that encourages immorality and compromise. Revelation 2, 14 and 15. But I have... A few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and commit fornication. You can also find parallel of this in 1 Corinthians 10, 5 to 8, Numbers 25, 1 to 9. You can write it down. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 to 8, Numbers 25, 1 to 9. You are men of God, you've probably seen these things before. Now, what did, what did uh, Balaam do? Well, some passages call him a soothsayer. But Balaam was a man that was renowned for his prophecy. He tried to curse Israel, but the angel of the Lord resisted him. And what did he do in Numbers? He told those people to invite the children of Israel to their feast. And their feast was sexual orgies. And, you know, they, 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 you know all those pagan temples, apart from the, the prophetic things they say they do, they are, they are just sexual. And one of the things you need to notice, please listen to me very carefully. Pastor Simon is here today. There was a story that happened, Pastor Simon, if you recollect. Pastor, stand up. If I'm, if I'm not saying it right, correct me. That time when Yelwa, a so-called prophet came to town. And there was a sister who is not, not our member. The, the, where they used to tell people to wait, Abby. Where they used to say, come and see me in, in the hotel. All the people where they go see them for hotel. Come and see me in the hotel. Why can't he cancel you in the church? Men of God, cancel them in the church. He said, she said, the man only touched her like this. Like this. That's all. She didn't know what. And she went to the hotel. By the time she came to herself, the man had had sex with her. Is that not correct? The problem now, she now came to our ministry to ask us, she has been married, never been unfaithful to her husband once. In fact, I think after a while, she started going to look for the man, where the man was. She traveled to the east to look for the man and lied to the husband. 
Thank you, Pastor. Look at me very well. If you fool yourself that everybody saying Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit, Satan will wreck you. You are not living in an age where you, you must have discernment. You must follow the inside. If you are not comfortable, if he doesn't agree with scripture, let that prophet carry himself somewhere. This is a woman who has never been unfaithful. She's not sleeping with a prophet. She even lies to her husband to go and meet that man where he was. That means something, there was a divine connection somewhere that was not of God. I don't care if the prophet knows your phone number. I don't care if the prophet knows how much is in your bank account. I don't care if the prophet knows what you are wearing underneath your clothes. Which kind of word of knowledge talks about what women are wearing under their clothes? That is not the spirit of God. That is divination. That is demonic. Listen to me very well. You don't have to like it. If a man is prophesying and is sleeping with everybody coming, it's fake. If you hang around there, you will do it eventually. <sighs> God forgives. But you cannot continue to live that kind of lifestyle. So Balaam had a so-called prophetic gift. But side by side with his prophetic gift is to encourage fornication. And Jesus said, I hate it. If Jesus hates something. Let me give you another small caution. Thank God for deliverance ministry. I don't look for demons, but when we see them, we cast them out. But if you must deliver somebody, you're a pastor. You and the person you are delivering. Only two of you, you lock yourself in your room. Satan has got the key to that room. He's coming to meet you. <laughs> I have prayed for many people after they've fallen who say, well, you know, we're doing deliverance from 12 midnight and then something went wrong. <laughs> the person delivering person he too now needs deliverance himself. <laughs> Just use a bit of common sense. Come to church. Open all the windows. Invite another brother, another sister to join you. Simple thing. When I was a much younger man, I will not call the man's name. I served that man as a teenager even. But what I saw, I told myself, that's not for me. That's not for me. This man, he will lie, sisters. He will say he's doing, how did he say? He's doing, is it spiritual check or what? They will stay, they will stay in, his, in his room or they will lie on his bed. So maybe we will just come and we'll finish, we we'll go home. It is him and them. No wonder scandals came. Scandals, scandals. And that ministry died. I've seen things. What I went to the University of Ibadan. One of my friends, my classmates, a sister in Christ. They took her behind the chapel. If anybody knows the University of Ibadan very well. They took her behind the chapel. Ah! We were coming from lectures. We were coming from lectures. It was, in the, it was not even night, we were coming from lectures. I, I, we could hear this sister, what's her name? She was all screaming. You know, the way you are screaming as if when people are trying to beat you. Now, pray out. If you let anybody do that to you, me and myself, I will first beat you when you come back <laughs> for being such a fool. When we got to her, this man of God, man of God, they were pulling her underpants and they said there were demons in her private area. That was the day I just looked at him. Ah, bro, today, bro, today. I just turned my back. And that's the last time I saw the man. I said, if that is your ministry, go to hell with your ministry. So, but many of you, 
Yeah, but he prophesied small, and then he touched your brain small. <laughs> what kind of anointing is that? They took this girl's pants off. They said there were rings in her private area. And you cannot speak the word to destroy the ring. You must strip her. I'm afraid that sounds grotesque, but we are living with mad people now. They have infiltrated the church, and we must expose their secrets. I was not going to share that story, but there's no way you will not share some things. There's another girl like that. She went totally mad. I don't know, maybe she recovered, but I mean, when I say mad, they were chaining her at a point. Don't let them confuse you. That is the spirit of Balaam. They will prophesy, but there's immorality with it. Another thing about the spirit of Balaam is about gain. The same with the spirit of divination. But you see immorality. Many people will say, you are not, Reverend, you are not walking in love. I am walking in love. I've told you that God will forgive your past. But you cannot continue to live like a devil and mix prophecy and be defiling people. Hmm. Let's look at another spirit. After these three spirits, I think we will close. But they are operating large in the body of Christ. I said they are what? Operating large in the body of Christ. Nobody should be telling you, uh, I'm going to bath you in the river. That's not New Testament. It's not in the epistles. It's not in the gospel. It's just rubbish. If you are still following things like that, you are not okay. Okay? Uh, then another spirit, Revelation 2, verses 6 and 15. Acts 6, 5, write it down. All right. But these thou hast, Revelation 2, 6, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, Acts 5 tells us the, the, the origin of uh, Nicholas, the Nicolaitans. Nicholas was one of the deacons in Acts 6 5, but he was a proselyte. That means he was a convert from paganism to Judaism and finally to Christianity. Their own problem, that spirit, the spirit of the Nicolaitans if you are writing, is an inclusive spirit of compromise which produces worldliness in the church. The spirit of Nicolaitans is an inclusive spirit of compromise which produces worldliness in the church. After that, we'll look at Jezebel, then I'll tie it up. Praise God. These morning meetings are for people who want to eat good food. Huh? Not milk, solid meat. Praise the Lord. What is the spirit of the Nicolaitans? It's all over the world today. Somebody was telling me the other day there are about 100 genders they have now. A pastor in the UK was telling me that we were in a restaurant and she, he was saying, ah, that's that. I didn't even know what was. I just looked like a bushman. So that's another gender there. I said, what is that gender? You see, the truth today is that if I went to one church in America some years ago, and as I was praying for people, I kept seeing chains on the women's legs. And I would open my eyes, and there's no chain. I will close up my eye, I will see chain. I will open my eye, there's no chain. So now I went home, I had to ask the pastor, a woman, I said, Pastor, what's all this chain all over your people? He said, they are all lesbians. And they were ministering with us in the church. They were, in fact, they were the people catching people that were falling down. <laughs> I'm telling you. Ah, but it, it was very strange. You are praying. I'm, oh, can I, blah, 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 blah. I was just a big chain on two legs. Was, ah, oh, ah. Virtually everywhere I turned, big chains. That's what we spoke to. Say. So, you know, it's our world, our world, all lesbians. I didn't even know how to counsel the woman. I said, to her. This is another one. No? <laughs> We are from Angua, 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 Angua. We don't know this one. I just looked and said, Now, now let, let me say this that may shock you. 
Jesus does not hate lesbians and gays. He died for them too. He doesn't hate them. But what we cannot do is to change the Bible and now say it is accepted. If somebody has had some history and wants help, we can help the person. Just like he doesn't hate drunkards. He doesn't hate uh, thieves. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? But for you to now say, hmm, let's mix everything together. That's the Nicolaitan spirit. And the reason the Nicolaitans were like that if you study church history is the fact that if you don't eat food sacrificed to idols, if you don't do these things, the trade unions will cut you off. That means you cannot get work. For example, if you're a carpenter and you don't cooperate, you will not get work. So the Nicolaitans said, hmm, let's do everything with them. You know, let us at least things we move. We have to be careful. When you are waiting for your season to change as a pastor, don't water down the word of God. Don't water down your lifestyle as a Christian. Don't say, well, it's all right. Let's just do whatever. Listen to me. I've told God, if you don't do anything more for me in my life than what you have done, I'm ready to face you the way I am. But I won't violate my conscience. One backsliding boy, the other day said, one backsliding boy, the other day said, Jesus told them to go and take water, uh, money from a fish mouth because Jesus was dealing with marine spirit. One local pastor in this town, <laughs> I said this one, is Koboko we are supposed to use and flog you. <laughs> you this foolish boy. You see, people are looking for everything to mix it. That, is it in the name of breakthrough? So I say, it doesn't matter what you do. As long as you bring them to Jesus, it matters what you do. Let me, let me you know where I'm leaving these uh, things towards the end. Nicolaitans will tell you the riches of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. So if Yahoo Yahoo come to their church, they will pray for them. Say, Yahoo Yahoo, say, I'm about to go and Yahoo Yahoo people say, okay, Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this Yahoo Yahoo boy and make him to tithe. <laughs> The spirit of the Dukolaitans. I was in a church, I don't want to mention the country, because it's a, it's, a, it's a great church. And there was a woman, it's a European country, and there was a woman there who was working with prostitutes. I don't want to call the name of the organization again, it's a small world. She said to me, please, Pastor, I would like you to meet some of our girls. Okay? So we finished service that day, and the girls came. Nigerian girls, girls from the West Coast. Uh, I was, ah! I started crying inside. Some of them were just 18, 19, 20. Somebody had promised that they would go abroad, they would make money. The madam is somewhere, and they have to be repaying her. They can't come home. Some of those people say they are abroad. That's what they are doing, you know? Then the madam told me that, the woman, the white woman told me that, the madam who is in charge of these girls, they are actually members of Pentecostal churches in that town. Somebody's daughter, 18 year old, lives in Nigeria. You put her in prostitution. You told her parents you are going to train her, but you put her in prostitution. And then she's paying you back. Maybe they'll say you owe me 30,000 euros. She'll be sleeping around. So I was talking to some of the girls. Oh, no. In fact, that day I could not eat. So I told one of the girls, like, what if we got you out of this thing? So I was, in, so, so I, was in, I was in first year in the Nigerian university before they took me out. They told my mother, I'm going to, they're taking me to Europe. Clean aisle. If there's no admission letter, and you've paid fees, let the girls sit down. I said, if there's no admission letter and you've paid fees, let her sit at home. Then, I was speaking to one of the girls, <laughs> and the father really threw me. She said, my pastor knows I'm in this business, and I pay tight. Yes. And I pay tight. That's the spirit of the Nicolaitans. 
all inclusiveness. It doesn't matter. Let us all be together. Let's not say evil about anything. What is the spirit of Nicolaitans? Please, I'm not preaching religion, but try to understand where I'm coming from. Little cigarette, little drink, a little that. It's just your issue all together. May the Lord help us. Now listen to me, pastors, as I take one more thought here. Everybody in church will not be at the same level, and the church is a hospital. But we don't have the right to lower the standard of the Word of God. If somebody comes to our church and is struggling with something and struggling with another thing, my job as a pastor is to help that person come out. But my job is not to tell the person that, well, God doesn't mind. God minds. He loves you, but he minds. If you are still with me, please wave your hand because we're going to go to we're going to go to Mama Jesus now. Our own spirit too. The spirit of Balaam is about greed for money. Now you see, Yahweh is coming. You are praying for them. The day powder people too come, you pray for them. May the Lord help His church. All right, let's um, let's take one more. I hope, and then we we'll try to round up now. Praise the Lord. Revelation 2.20, the Amplified Classic. While you are waiting for your season. Well, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, claiming to be inspired, who is teaching and leading astray my servants and beguiling them into practicing sexual vice and eating food sacrificed to idols. You can also write 1 Kings 16, 31 to 33 down. Um, there's a lot on my plate. I'm just going to round up after this one. And then we'll, we'll pray. Okay. You know Jezebel, the daughter of Etabal, the king of the Sudanians, married King Ahab. And Jezebel's thing was about combining the worship of Yahweh or the worship of God with the worship of Baal. Hallelujah. That was Jezebel's thing. The spirit of Jezebel, if you are writing down, is a controlling, immoral, false, prophetic ministry which combines the worship of false gods with God. The spirit of Jezebel is a controlling, immoral, false, prophetic ministry which combines the worship of false gods with God. The Bible also says, write down 1 Corinthians 10, 21 and 22. It says, we cannot eat from the table of God and the table of devils. Mm. Hallelujah. I'll make this one and then I'll just summarize the, the remaining points because we don't have the time to touch all of them today. But, praise the Lord. You remember the story of Jezebel? Of course, she married King Ahab and she tried to combine Baal worship. Our brother's testimony today is what is happening with the spirit of Jezebel. You try to combine Christianity with some traditional religion. And today, it is actually combined already. It takes somebody with discernment to see that what's going on here is not the Spirit of God. It's a challenge. It's a challenge today. But my word to you this morning is that you have a direct communication with your Father. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in worship. You see, when you combine all these fetish objects, you are actually mixing things up. Jezebel, Jezebel, you, you know, try to combine the worship of God with the worship of Baal. Is an evil spirit. And you need to deal with that spirit. It, it manipulates. It's also an immoral spirit. It's also an immoral spirit. Let, let me read Revelation. Let me just read that scripture one more time. Revelation. Uh-huh. 
Can you put Revelation 2.20 up? Who is teaching and leading astray my servants and beguiling them into practicing sexual vice and eating food sacrificed to idols? You see it? Food sacrificed to idols. Sexual. The, the, the thing is, most of this, be it the spirit of Balaam, the spirit of Jezebel, immorality is part of it. Have you noticed today, even though we, we do not want to say it, we, we, we are sometimes, have you noticed today that the level of immorality, if you go into a church where the level of immorality is very high, you are dealing with a spirit of Jezebel, you are dealing with a spirit of Balaam, and most of the time it starts from the top down. There are so many innocent girls who have innocently gone to church. They've been disvirgined by their pastors. Hello? They've terminated many pregnancies for their choir master. Come on now. I know you're all looking at me as if this one, where did it drop from? That's the spirit. And if you are a pastor, you must fight that spirit. If you don't fight it, it will get into your church. It's, it's, it is all over the place. You must fight it. People that carry the things of the, ho the Lord must stay holy. They must stay pure. Is, there so is somebody hearing what I'm saying? There are people that will make mistakes. Of course, God will forgive them. But where, you, where there's a spirit of Jezebel, the, the Nicolaitan spirit, there's a spirit of Balaam, it's all mixed together. You can do anything. It's okay. Friends, it's not okay. All right, as I round up this morning in this teaching, if you read Ezekiel 37, where we read down, it said, as I prophesied, there was a noise and there was what? A shaking. And bone came to his bone. One of the things I want to say to you that in this season that God is going to bring change to you, you need to find your own bone, find your spiritual DNA. Where has God placed you? Where is your portal place? Where has God connected you? The early church, the Bible says, when they were persecuted, they came to their own company. I want to say there's a company. There's a place where God has placed you. And as you begin to find the right connection, the, the pure connection, the one God has called you to, I want to assure you, child of God, this morning, that that season change will come. You will arise as a mighty army this morning. You will get into what God has prepared for you because eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what God has prepared for those that love him. I want to say to you, as your season begins to hear your voice this morning, as your season begins to hear your voice, as you begin to make the right consecration, as you begin to declare what God has said concerning you, as you are instant in season, as you are instant out of season, and as your season hears your voice, voice this morning. I want to say to a child of God, there's going to be a turn around. I want to say to a child of God, there's going to be a turn around. I'd like you to lift your hand and begin to talk to the Lord this morning.